This video is the continuation and conclusion of a previous video, Part 1, Hypersonic Missile Defense by Cross-Polarization Jamming. The bottom line, accounting for the pointy radio made out of a material with a high dielectric constant and an underlying reflector antenna, I'd be surprised if the cross-pole isolation of this system is lower than about minus 17 dB viewed nose on. That's about 10 dB higher cross-polar gain than a fully gimbaled rear-fed reflector with an F over D of, say, 0.4, where the feed scans with the reflector, like the MG13 does, and which I have measured because I own one. Now I want to insert a little piece here to answer an obvious question. What happens to the isolation between the copole and cross-pole antenna patterns if the radome dielectric constant is changed from 3 to 6, which is what we're talking about, and with, with no other changes? So I did just that using the Engage Antenna Design Assist application for five different generic antenna radome models. A rear-fed reflector antenna, a flat plate array antenna, an inverse Cassegrain a rep antenna represented as a reconfigured rear-fed reflector, a mirror scan reflector, and a truncated reflector antenna. And here are the results. Pause the video if you want to have a closer look. Uh, as expected, changing the dielectric constant from 3 to 6 has increased the relative gain of the cross-polar antenna pattern in each case by rather a lot. And here's an important caveat. It's a single layer radome model that I did not try to tune by adjusting its thickness. The cross-polar isolation is a function of both frequency and radome thickness as well as the dielectric constant, but I didn't play around with that. I just want to have a quick look. Anyway, the right side here, uh, right side column, shows how much the relative cross-polar gain was increased uh, by changing the dielectric to, to 6. Uh, the numbers are not offered as final values since the model is not validated for this kind of comparison, but I believe it is correct in that it predicts the gain change of maybe more than 10 dB across the board, except for the truncated reflector since its cross-polar gain is inherently high already, high already for obvious reasons if you think about it. Anyway, continuing here, uh, compared with the MG13, I expect the KH31 antenna with a ceramic radome to be much more susceptible to cross-pull jamming than the MG13 without a radome, and the MG13 design is already highly susceptible. This is an anonymized archival video of the MG13 responding to non-cognitive cross-pull jamming. It is representative of what I would expect the effect of cross-pull jamming to be on a hypersonic missile in the context of this video. The jamming causes large angle errors and, and sightline rates in both azimuth and elevation, which will prevent the missile from hitting the ship. And since the missile is guided in azimuth and elevation, it may also cause the missile's physical destruction by impact with the sea surface. So that's hard kill by jamming. No bullets or anti-missile missiles required or decoys required. Nothing goes overboard. And yes, this video looks like the simulations. And don't forget that the dielectric constant is affected by temperature, so that needs to be considered also. Testing the effects of cross-pole jamming against a supersonic or hypersonic missile must account for the effect of the temperature heating on the properties of the radome. And for an anechoic chamber tests or air carry tests of a real system, this may, but only may, require the radome to be replaced, the original equipment manufacturer radome, to be replaced with an analog one that behaves electrically like the very hot flight article. I picture uh, the same radome shape, but made from a different material, whose dielectric constant matches what's expected for the real article, heated to whatever its in-flight temperature is. Okay, so putting all this together, it suggests to me that whatever antenna type is under the radome, the laws of physics and electromagnetics will force the designers to create an antenna system which will have a relatively high cross-polar gain and will therefore be susceptible in principle to cross-pole jamming a little or a lot. To finish this summary part off, I want to express these points in a slightly different way. The seeker from a Mach 2.5 missile could be used in a Mach 10 missile because the Mach 10 missile has to slow down to Mach 2.5 at the end or the seeker can't see through the plasma. And that means that although you can bring a Mach 2.5 seeker to the Mach 10 party, you can't bring the Mach 2.5 radome. And the reason is that the radome has to be able to survive the Mach 10 cruise phase. And when it comes to cross-pole, the pointy-shaped high dielectric constant radome is an important vulnerability that is baked into the design by the laws of physics and electromagnetics and thermodynamics, no matter the country of origin. To make this yet more real, 
uh, in order for the missile to hit something that could move after the missile is fired, like an aircraft carrier, it has to have a secret. It needs to have a sensor that's gimbaled in azimuth and elevation so it can find and track the target. And if the missile is high subsonic or possibly even uh, supersonic, like up to Mach 2.5, then the material of choice for a radome is a thermoplastic, you know, something made out of plastic, tough plastic, and that will work fine. Uh, the uh, radio waves will travel through plastic, just no problem. Um, but if the missile travels faster at uh, uh, Mach 10, let's say, hypersonic missile, this will melt during the cruise phase. So instead, we have to use a casserole dish, cookware, basically ceramic. The trouble is above Mach 5, the, the, the front of the missile will have a plasma around it. So the, the cookware, which is transparent to right microwave signals, doesn't look like this. Electrically, it looks like this. It looks like a metal, and the radio waves won't go through that. So the thing has to slow down. But after it slows down, it's stuck with the cookware, because it can't use this. And the dielectric constant of the thermoplastics is around 3, but the dielectric constant of a, of a ceramic is between 5 and 6. It's closer to 6, let's say. And that means more polarization twisting, which means that the designers were forced to build a vulnerability into the hypersonic missile. And it's there after it slows down, because it needed the cookware for the cruise phase. Susceptibility to cross-pole jamming. And when it comes to hypersonic missiles, I see online references to five of these goddamn things that are either emerging or already here. Two from Russia, two from China, and one from India. And it looks to me like they will all have to be guided in azimuth and elevation from their descriptions. Here's an engaged simulation representing a hypersonic missile flying a supersonic Mach 2.5 terminal phase against a surface ship equipped with a cross-pole jammer that has been fitted with the Invicta engagement controller that I designed. The missile flies wide of the protected ship. And here's another simulation, perhaps more typical, in which the jammer forces the missile into an unrecoverable dive and the missile is destroyed by hitting the sea surface. And here's the same simulation, but using a different playback application. And then if the missile is ASL guided, then ignoring, ignoring sophistications, which might be built into the autopilot, it may be possible for an active onboard cross-pole jammer, a cognitive one, to cause the missile to develop an unrecoverable heading error. And if that heading error is a dive, it could mean physical destruction of the missile by impact with the sea surface. That's hard kill caused by an active onboard jammer. Think about that. So this is just one simulation in which I've shown in which the missile hits the sea surface is physically destroyed by the jamming. Uh, but there are others. And this is very similar to what I have seen in anechoic chamber tests in which I was a trials director. So all of this, broadly speaking, in this video is, uh, is interesting stuff for countering hypersonic missiles or supersonic missiles or any kind of missile, really. But it doesn't matter unless there is a cross-pole jammer, cross-pole capable jammer available in the real world. So is there a cross-pole jammer available? The answer is yes. I am aware of three naval jammers that are advertised to have a cross-pole capability. Lockheed Martin Canada advertises the Ramses jammer, and the Raven Jammer. Talus UK offers the Scorpion 2 Jammer, which is also advertised to have cross pull. And I believe there are others, but I cannot provide evidence of this in an open forum. Recently, the Canadian Minister of Defence, Bill Blair, announced a joint initiative with Australia to develop countermeasures against hypersonic missiles, spending up to $474 million jointly over the next five years. Now, I suspect most of this will be allocated to hard kill solutions because hard kill is intuitively easy for the non-experts to understand, and they're the ones who control the money. Personally, I think you're going to have to put a zero behind the $474 million to solve the problem with hard kill. And even if it does get solved that way, there's a resupply issue because you have to leave when you run out of bullets or missiles. But history tells a different story. According to a 1994 thesis published by the Naval Postgraduate School, hard kill has historically, up to the point of the thesis, not been effective at all. The thesis compares the historical use of hard kill and soft kill in various missile engagements that have actually happened. So here's a link to the, the thesis. So here's a piece taken from the conclusion. 
Soft kill measures employed against anti-ship missiles were extremely successful, seducing or decoying every missile it was used against. In every engagement where the defender was alerted and deployed soft kill measures, every missile salvo was entirely defeated. Hard kill measures were not as successful, with only one case confirmed. This is understandable since hard kills me uh, measures uh, to the date to date are, have primarily consisted of manual firing systems. More data is needed to combat, uh, assess the combat capabilities of modern hard kill systems. So fair enough. Maybe things have changed. And I would argue that some of that $474 million should be used to make an objective, unbiased assessment of particularly cognitive cross-pole jamming, unfettered by preconceptions, unfettered by rumor, unfettered by hearsay, and unfettered by unverified false claims presented as fact, because there's plenty of all of that around. By the way, I have done this investigation already, and the result is that I created the Invicta Cognitive Engagement Controller, which controls polarization, among other things, and which could be fit to any existing cross-pull jammer. So I would further argue that an effective countermeasure against hypersonic missiles is already in hand. All that's left is the engineering of it. And this concludes my thoughts about countermeasures against hypersonic missiles, and frankly, against all other families of radar homing missiles.